Welcome to Xavier University Library. I'm very pleased to see so many people and so many students in the audience and veterans to help us commemorate the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. Um, it's my pleasure as I'm Ian Rickos, I'm the University Archivist and Special Collections Librarian. And it's my pleasure to first um, introduce a little bit about this project. This came about as a result of a class that I co-taught with Ann Davies, is she? I think it's her, Ann Davies and Allison Morgan in the back, with a group of 16 first-year students. It was a first-year seminar class on Xavier's history, and one of the groups in that class explored uh, Xavier and World War I. So they did research projects using primary source material and then created a digital exhibit about what they learned. And then, in addition, last semester I was approached um, by Jacob Kreska, um, and he is interested in World War I, and he is a student here at Xavier, a public history student, and he's going to talk a little bit about the work that he did volunteering in the archive to help make the exhibit, which is on the third floor, I hope everyone goes to see it, and this talk by Father Kenny possible. So, Jacob, thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Jake Grasa. I'm a junior history major here. I, when I heard that we were doing an exhibit about uh, First World War in the library, I was pretty, I was pretty ecstatic about it. Uh, the First World War has always been a topic that's been close to me. Uh, I first got interested in the topic when I read All Quiet on the Western Front by Eric Maria Remarque. Uh, pretty much uh, any book where you read about men who are younger than me being sent off into the trenches where they know they're not coming back, it, it sticks with you. Uh, reading that book uh, got me to read more about the history of the conflict from both sides and more of the history of my own family. And I actually learned that my great-great-grandfather fought on the Asanzo front of the First World War where with the Italian Royal Army. And he gave the ultimate sacrifice and lost his leg in, in combat. Pretty much because of this, I started collecting uh, artifacts, uh, such as helmets, weapons, uniforms, uh, just anything related to the conflict as a means of preserving it. I always felt it was my duty to preserve a piece of history. And when I learned that Xavier was having an exhibit, I wanted to help out as best as I could. So what I did is I went through all these old newspaper articles, I read through uh, the stories of uh, men from Xavier in Cincinnati who went over, who volunteered to fight for their country. And in these stories, each and every man who gets sent is either my age or younger, which to me is astounding. Uh, Jo joining to fight a conflict for hundreds, well, thousands of miles away, and that they knew was horrible. When I also personally volunteer uh, to give parts of my exhibit, parts of uh, my collection to the exhibit, as uh, to make sure there were some aspects of physical history and uh, personal objects relating to the war in uh, the exhibit. For when you see one of those helmets or medals or weapons, you don't just see an object. You see the young soldier who wore them. You see a man who was 18 or 19 who willingly took up the call to arms to fight for his country, whether it be the United States, Germany, Italy, France, or England. Went on a boat over to France and then either sacrificed himself for his country, or came out of the war either scarred or with memories of the conflict. That, because of uh, those men, is why I chose to help with this project and chose to begin collecting and chose to become interested in the First World War. To see those artifacts, they are upstairs on the third floor, right by the elevator. Uh, there's also one that's going to be used at the Student Veterans Center lunch this weekend with uh, a veteran alumni that are coming back to campus. They'll have a little 
display for their event as well. So thank you, Jacob, for letting us borrow this. And now, Father Keneally, my esteemed colleague, the university historian, is going to uh, illuminate what Xavier and World War I means. So, Father Keneally, thank you. Thank you, Anne, in more ways than one. Thank you for the introduction, but also your generous help in putting this talk together today. This would not have happened without Anne's assistance. And for that matter, your wonderful research as well. So I'm very grateful to both of you. And also to Joe, who will be assisting as my technician, my technical skills being minimal. So today we will talk about the First World War and Xavier University, or Xavier College as it was called at the time. I must say at the beginning, I am not a professional historian, so I'm going to be talking about history uh, from the point of view of a, something of an amateur, but I hope I don't get it too wrong, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> the First World War has often been referred to as the Great War. Sometimes, ironically, the war that ended all wars, and we know, of course, that did not happen. The war began in the city of Sarajevo, uh, the capital of Bosnia-Herzegovina, and it occurred, the, the beginning occurred on July the 28th, 1914. It was on that particular day that a Bosnian Serb nationalist assassinated uh, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of the Austrian Hungarian Empire and his wife. And perhaps we could show them the first picture of the This is a picture of uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie and their family. And this is the couple that was assassinated there in Serbia, Sarajevo that day. What happened on that particular occasion was this. Um, Franz Ferdinand and his wife were visiting Sarajevo on an official trip. As they were leaving the city hall, they got into an automobile. The roof had been pulled back so that they could be viewed by the people as they drove along the street. As the car pulled away from the city hall, it stalled. And the assassin who was across the street in a cafe <coughs> realized his opportunity had come. He ran into the street, shot two bullets, and uh, killed the Archduke and his wife as well. They did not die immediately. Uh, when the aides finally got to the car, the Archduke had slumped over his wife into her lap, and his final words were rather touching ones. He said, please do not die, my dear Sophie. Live for the sake of our children. But he did not. He died almost instantly, and his wife died about a half hour later on the way to the hospital. Their assassinations were certainly not the major cause or the only cause of the First World War, but it certainly was the uh, spark that ignited the whole thing, because he was the heir to the Austrian-Hungarian Austrian Empire throne, and that's what made this a real provocative incident. As a result of this particular assassination, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia within the month. And then Russia came to the aid of Serbia, because Serbia was its ally. And then there was a domino effect. One country after another declared war, until eventually there were 30 countries that were belligerent in the war. And this was the family, unfortunately, where it all started. Next picture, Joe, please. Just to put this into some context for you, to line up the countries uh, in the war itself. And there were two sides. The, the central powers were made up principally of Germany, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, and Bulgaria. On the other side, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, France, Russia, Italy, notice, notice Japan, an Asiatic country, and eventually the United States. But in all, 30 countries eventually uh, became belligerents. Next question. One of the principal figures is this gentleman. This is the Emperor Wilhelm II of Germany, and one of the major figures in the war, oftentimes simply referred to as Kaiser Wilhelm, or simply the Kaiser. He was the King of Prussia and the Emperor of Germany at the time. The results of the war are significant, and I think we should at least make some mention of it here. As a result of the Great War, significant things happened because the war was a real watershed 
in the history uh, of Europe and, and really of the world itself. As a result of the war, four great imperial dynasties collapsed and disappeared. The Ottoman Empire, the Russian Empire and the Tsars, the German Empire, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire simply disappeared. The Bolsheviks came to power in Russia, and that led to eventually to the establishment of the Soviet Union, and we know what role they played in the history of the, the uh, 20th century. And finally, the war so destabilized European society that it laid the groundwork for World War II, and really set the stage for World War II, unfortunately. There's that famous statement that was made by General Ferdinand Foch, the head of the French army at the time. He was most disappointed with the Treaty of Versailles that ended the war. He said, this is a disaster. This is not peace. This is simply a truce for 20 years. And he turned out to be prophetic. 20 years later, in a few months, Nazi Germany invaded Poland, and Europe was back at war once again. <coughs> The war was really unprecedented up to the time in its slaughter, its carnage, its brutality, and its utter destruction. Just to give you some idea, as many as 70 million men were mobilized, 12 million by Russia alone, and Russia suffered terribly in this war. There are about 35 million casualties, civilian and military combined. Uh, over, and then over 15 million died as the direct effect of the war. And when I say direct effect, I'm not including the people who died of influenza, the terrible pandemic that took place, nor am I talking about the people who died in the Armenian genocide during the war. About 15, maybe as many as 17 million died. Notice the number of casualties among civilians. There are nine million combatants, but seven million. The war was devastating for civilians. The longest battle of the war is the one we know best, the Battle of Verdun, which took over 300 days. But the bloodiest battle of the war was at the River Somme, and it went from July to November 1916. Look at this. 57,000 British casualties on the first day. And they estimate that maybe as 50, about 15,000 men died in that battle. There were over one million casualties just in that one battle. And that's a conservative guess. Some, the, uh, some uh, history, historians think it might have been high as a million and a half. In addition, there were very severe food shortages throughout Europe. Probably hundreds of thousands of people died from malnutrition or from the diseases they had caused. And I find this particularly interesting. It's estimated 11% of the population of France either died or suffered from wounds during the war. It, it was a disaster. The question always comes up then, why were the casualties so high? Well, briefly, the reason is this. The clash was between an army with 19th century tactics using 20th century technology and weapons. That was the real problem. Artillery had become much more sophisticated, and it was absolutely lethal in its effects, devastating. It was the number one scourge of both the infantry and tanks as well. The machine gun was another major factor. It was developed in the late years of the 19th century, but by the time of the First World War, it could shoot 400 to 600 rounds per minute with a range of about 1,000 yards. So you can imagine a foot soldier leaving a trench <coughs> going against the enemy. First of all, he had to avoid landmines. Then he had to run into barbed wire fences, not to mention the artillery shells flying overhead and heaven knows where they were going to land. And you were running right into machine guns that fired 600 bullets a minute. So it was a real challenge, and little wonder the casualties were so high. This is the first major war in which the airplane was used. First of all, for reconnaissance, but later on really as a fighter and a bomber. And it also played a significant role. The tank was introduced by the British in 1915. But one of the more lethal weapons was chemical weapons, which is a, a fancy way of describing poison gas. This would have been chlorine gas, mustard gas, and was used first by the Germans, but eventually by both sides. 
And not to be overlooked is the submarine. The submarine played a very big part in this world and it was really new to warfare. The Germans built about 360 U-boats, as they were called. And they preyed really on British shipping throughout the war. German submarines, and I find this amazing, it is estimated sank 1.4 million tons of Allied shipping and destroyed about 50% of the British merchant fleet. So these were very devastating weapons as well. And of course, as we've seen, the German submarines played a very big part in the United States entering the war. But on the top of all that, field hospitals and medical facilities during the war really lacked all kinds of proper sanitation, and they caused the spread of great, a great deal of spread of disease. The United States, and we can flip again there because I think we have a picture of a U-boat there on the left. That's what I was describing, the German submarine. Initially, the United States remained neutral in the war and insisted on that. Our president at the time was Woodrow Wilson, He had been elected president in 1912. He was a Democrat. He uh, defeated really two Republicans, and because the Republican Party was split in 12, it was easier for him to win. He defeated William Howard Taft in Cincinnati, and also Theodore Roosevelt, who had run as an independent. But Roosevelt made, or Wilson made it very clear that at the beginning of the war, the United States would remain neutral. As he said, we must be neutral in fact, as well as in name, impartial in thought and action as well. He was reelected in 1916, and his slogan during that campaign was this, he kept us out of war, and he did, but not for long. The United States entered the war after German submarines began to attack neutral vessels, and that's really what plunged us into the war. Move to the next one, Joe. The worst incident of all was the Lusitania, and I guess most people have heard of that. The Lusitania was an ocean liner, a British ocean liner, I think belonged to the Cunard Line. The Lusitania was a lovely vessel. It had sailed out of New York City, and it was going to Liverpool in England. That was its port of point of deportation. As it came around the southern part of Ireland, very near the city of Cork. It was torpedoed by uh, a German submarine and sank very, very quickly. This was on May the 7th, 1915. It was a disaster. There were 1,959 passengers on this liner and 1,195 perished, including 123 Americans. And that's what really riled up American sentiment. The Germans backed off for a short period of time. But in January 1917, the Germans were desperate to end the war. So they decided on an unrestricted submarine warfare against any vessel that approached the English British Isles at all. And as the German ambassador explained to President Wilson, no ships will be spared. Well, that was the last straw, and the United States declared war on April the 6th 1917. So as I said, we declared war, and shortly thereafter, as you can see, on May the 18th, Congress passed the Selective Service Act, which it introduced conscription for the draft. The act required that all men in the United States between the ages of 21 and 30 had to register for the draft. Then each state was assigned a certain quota of baptists from their, depending on their population. By the end of the war, 2.7 million men were drafted and about 1.3 million volunteered. So our armies and navy and our, our military came to about 4 million. About 116,000 American military personnel died of all causes. Uh, that would include <coughs> combat wounds and disease and uh, about 200,000 were wounded. Joe, how about the next? <clears throat> Patriotism ran very high. There, there was a patriotic fever that went across the country. But unfortunately, it was accompanied by a spirit of propaganda 
And propaganda led to a really a, a, a very violent outbreak of anti-German anti -German sentiment throughout the country, almost in hysteria. And the hysteria are targeted Germans, but also German immigrants to the United States and Americans of German descent as well. Because of the Espionage Act of 1917, a number of German sympathizers, no more than sympathizers, were jailed and thrown into jail. And some of them really are rather flimsy evidence. A classic example is the one right here. The gentleman here on the left is Dr. Ernst Kuhnwald. And Ernst Kuhnwald uh, was Austrian born, but he was the conductor of the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra from 1912 to 1917, and the Cincinnati May Festival from 1914 to 1917, when he was forced to, to resign. Exactly what he did, we're not totally sure, because the charges were never released. This was a rather suspicious time. But this is true. He made it very clear to the orchestra and very clear to the patrons of the symphony that his sympathies were totally with Austria. That's probably all it took. He was arrested. Here he is entering the federal building in downtown Cincinnati, and he was in prison for the rest of the war. And that was that it ruined his career as well. So we went back to Austria afterwards. So this was one example of the hysteria for the others. German businesses throughout the country were boycotted, especially breweries, interesting enough. Also interesting, tell me to the next. There were about 200 German newspapers across the country because there were many people in this country who were of German origin and they had newspapers. This was one of the Cincinnati German newspapers, the Fondage Volkswagen. And it had come into existence about 1830 because Cincinnati had a huge German population and it was a very popular paper. But all of these papers, all, probably all 200 of them, lost patronage, they lost advertising, they lost subscribers, and most of them went out of business, unfortunately. This paper went out of existence in 1919, largely because of the war. But there are other things as well that we can note. The historian got to a point where the names of streets were changed. So there was a Bremen Street in over the Rhine in Cincinnati. Bremen, of course, is a city in Germany, so the name had to be changed. It became Republic Street. Um, other things like the names of food, sauerkraut had to go. It was too German. So the substitute for sauerkraut became Liberty Cabbage. That's what it was called for the war. And hamburgers became Liberty Sandwiches. Thank heavens that didn't last. <laughs> but even the, uh, education, and this, this is really rather foolish, to show their solidarity in the war effort, the Cincinnati <coughs> Board of Education announced that the German language would no longer be taught in the Cincinnati schools beginning in June 1918. Pure prejudice. But any minor view of that, this is a typical poster, and this is an official one. This is for Liberty Bonds. And that's how the Germans are characterized, as Huns. And uh, this was very common. And those of us who were in the Second World War, I grew up in the Second War, this type of thing went on as well. Till the next one. This is a poem that appeared in the Athenaeum. Now, that's a student publication here at Seeger. still exists. This is a beautiful poem, a trailette. We could talk about that too, but we'll do that on another occasion. But look at it. When our boys go over there, victory will surely come. Teutons, many, many, they will stare. When our boys go over there, tears and shouts will run the air, striking all the poor Huns dumb. Notice Huns, Teutons, these were the kinds of words that were used to describe Germans. And this probably was not another innocent one. This is a student of the college at the time. Joe, next one. That brings us then to St. Xavier College, and you know, the long introduction, but uh, I hope it was some help. This is how St. Xavier College, as it was known at the time, looked during the war, between 1914 and 1918. And for those of you who don't know the background, let me just uh, go over it a bit. 
This is the corner of 7th and Sycamore downtown. It's the west side of the street. The church is still there. and pretty much looks as it does in that picture from 1914. But the school building, of course, was demolished in 1961. So that is nothing but a parking lot. But this was the school at the time. This building had been put up beginning right after the Civil War. It was built for a period of about 25 years in three parts. So you can see, first of all, the building at the corner of 7th and Sycamore with the double stairs and the lovely porch. That was the Jesuit residence on the top floors and administration on the first. Going about halfway back, you can see where the building was divided. That second part of the back was built later. That's where the cafeteria was, the student library was, and classrooms. Then across the front, parallel to Sycamore Street here, those were classrooms and labs, and there was a lovely chapel in there. And I know that well because I went to high school in that building before it was torn down. The school at that time had an eight-year program. Most Jesuit schools early had a six-year program based on the European model. But by 1914, the Jesuits had begun to adapt their system to the American system. So this now was one college with eight years, but slowly dividing into a high school and a university or a college. The first four years were acad the academic department, or as this card puts it, the academy. That was the first four years they were becoming a high school. The top four years, all the collegiate department was becoming a college. So this is how it looked in 1918. The following year in 1919, of course, the two schools formally split. The high school stayed downtown, and the university or college at that time moved to this campus right here. That was in 1919. But that's how the building looked at, at that time. Uh, Joe, let's move to the next, if we can. Patriotism ran very high among the students. Raymond McCoy, name that the old timers here might remember. Raymond McCoy was a student at the time, and he gave the valedictory address for the class of 1917. And it was a stirring address filled with great patriotism. He quoted Cardinal Gizmas, Gibbons in this, to this effect. Above all else, we must be loyal to our country, and our loyalty must be manifested not in words alone, but in deeds. And uh, Ray McCoy came back later, uh, to be our dean of the graduate school for many years. This poem, again, gives you some idea of just how fervent the patriotism was at the time, but also an appreciation of how severe the war was. Destructive war by gory hands still dripped with blood, by merciless, unfruitful aim makes men, once brothers, take the cup and sip the hateful wine of enmity. To maim and kill, the only work thou thinkest of despising tender, touching ties of love. There's that beautiful alliteration in the last line. But this gives you something of the spirit. But the real investment in time and effort at the school, and I think we can move on to it, was a program called the Xavier Unit of the Student Army Training Corps. In August of 1917, Congress established this program. The Student Army Training Corps, established by Congress. And it was designed like the ROTC program to prepare college students for possible military service. That's where the program. Xavier College joined, and we became a unit in this particular program. And it, I don't whether you can read too much of this, but it says students, Army Training Corps for all high school graduates and college men 18 or over. And it was a training program. You received a stipend from the government and a uniform from the government. And uh, the, 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 this was really just a full uh, time army training program. 232 young men enrolled, mostly from Ohio and Kentucky. And they were housed, and we'll show a picture of it in a minute, of the Fenwick Club downtown. So they had a barracks, and they lived very near the school. The curriculum was modified to meet the new needs of these future officers. Each day the men got in their uniforms and paraded, marched over to classes, and drilling and forced marches, I love forced marches, I know exactly what those are, took place on Reading Road 
the cobblestones of Reading Road. You know that every one of us wants cobblestones. But this was the program, and they were very proud of this. Here's an advertisement for it. It's patriotic to go to college. Give your, give your country your best. Serve your country as your country wishes to be served in the most efficient way. Become a student soldier. And uh, that's the, uh, the advertisement for it. And here's another one, basically the same advertising. And as I say, 232 people enrolled. This is the old Fenwick Club downtown, and this is where they uh, were barracks. Uh, this was torn down, I guess, in the, the 60, 1960s, and this is exactly where the Procter and Gable complex now is. This is 6th Street, went over to 5th Street between Sycamore and Broadway, and all of that eventually came down, and that's where they were, um, that, that's where they were quartered. Right? Here's a picture of the very first day of this the SITC um, uh, inauguration. This is the school year, the schoolyard, the building you just saw. That Sycamore Street there, separated over the gate. Notice all the people <coughs> gathered for the ceremony. And this picture was taken, I guess, from the porch uh, of the entrance to the school there. This picture. This gentleman here, uh, I know very well. This is my father, <laughs> and it has the picture has an interesting history to it. This picture has been in the family annals for years, but we could never figure out why my father was in a uniform. He was never in the military. How in the world did he get this uniform? Well, when I learned about the SATC at Xavier, I realized what happened. As a college student, he enrolled. So he was in this program, though he never went into the military because the war ended uh, before, before it, uh, he could do this. So here he is, probably about 19 years old, in his uniform, with not a military one, but an SATC uniform. So, just a little bit of fun that the Athenaeum had with the program, uh, making jokes about uh, life in the barracks at the uh, Fenwick Club, and uh, all the usual things that probably uh, privates and others in the military do. So. The program ended rather quickly because by November the war was over, and this simply says that the SATC program was disbanded, disbanded uh, in Dece on December the 21st. So it didn't last very long. It was probably about four or five months. So, and they ended up with a banquet. Uh, here is the, end, the program, the souvenir, the farewell banquet of the Students' Army Training Corps, which ended in December. But they certainly did have event, an eventful period of time uh, at the Fenway Club there. Because this is when the influenza pandemic broke out. And this was a very significant event during the First World War. It is estimated that maybe 30 million people died worldwide of influenza, sometimes called the Spanish flu. The flu rocked the city of Cincinnati in the fall and winter of 1918 and of course affected the young men in the barracks at uh, the Fenway Club. They were quarantined about two weeks into the program, could not leave there. We know that at least one high school student and one commercial school Xavier student died of the flu, uh, and probably pretty lucky that it was not more. On October the 10th, the flu broke out at the Fenway Club, they were quarantined, and from 46 to 33 cases of flu occurred just in that building, just in that group. And they were quarantined there until October the 23rd, when they were finally allowed to leave the building. Mr. Felix Koch, a professor of the Knight School, is ill at the General Hospital with influenza. This is what we're talking about. The Cecilia Nolan Pike Street, where the Taft Museum is today, a member of the class in accounting uh, died during the past week of influenza. So it was a scourge. When it was all over, they had uh, presented a plaque to the Fenway Club, which remained on the walls there in commemoration of this particular event and the intercession of Our Lady that they felt had saved the lives of so many. So on the left, you have the wording of the plaque that was in the uh, Fenway Club. It has been erected in fulfillment of a vow 
our loving gratitude to Our Lady Help of Christians and the protection bestowed on the institution and the students of the program for, for the, uh, there in the, during the epidemic of 1918. 53 young men were stricken, but no deaths, and they were very proud of the fact there were no deaths. It is likewise a memorial to the Sisters of Charity of Mount St. Joseph and lay nurses from Good Samaritan Hospital who came to our aid and of whom three, two sisters and three nurses contracted this dread disease while administering to our boys. They also were spared through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin, and this is one way of our expressing our gratitude. So in the pandemic, it was really um, an episode that people at the time surely would not forget. With regard to the students and their involvement in the war, we know that well over 100 Xavier alumni or former students served in the military, many of them having volunteered, some having been drafted. Many saw action in Europe, and a number were injured, for instance. Go to the next. Uh, let me go back one if we could. Bold Run, this is interesting. This is, uh, uh, again, from the Athenaeum. The plunging, low-bucking fullback who carried the ball for Xavier some five years ago recently reported severely injured. We venture to say that it took a full-sized German to stop bull if the fight was hand-to-hand. -hand. <laughs> this is a picture of the baseball team from 1914. I suspect probably most, if not all, of these young men went up in service, and three of them were injured. Howard Creed, John Yost, Clayton Kiefer, Kiefer were all wounded. And they are, if you can see the picture, in the second row, the two people on the far left, that is Howard Creed and John Yost. And Clayton Kiefer is the young man kneeling on the left in the first row there. They were all injured uh, in, in head wounds in action. This is uh, also interesting because the question comes up. How many Xavier alums and how many Xavier former students died in military service? And uh, thanks to the research that we've done, we have come up with at least 20. At least 20. There may be more. And as the research goes on, maybe we'll find more. But at least 20 Xavier graduates, former students, died while serving in the military. But notice the causes of death. This is very interesting. Four were killed in action. One died of wounds, seven of pneumonia, one of influenza, one of diphtheria, one meningitis, one appendicitis, very interesting, one in an auto accident, and three died in the world. We don't know the cause. We don't know. Unknown. And that's rather interesting statistics. Yeah. This gentleman is Leo Austin, the class of 17, uh, graduated from the College of Commerce and Finance, who expired at Camp Sherman. Camp Sherman is in Chillicothe, Ohio, only about 100 miles from here. But he died of pneumonia, one of the people who died of pneumonia. A gold star here to Bernard Kinkle, class of 17 also, the first St. Xavier man, as far as we know, to give his life for the cause. He died after an operation for appendicitis at Fort Thomas, Kentucky, just across the river. Many people probably don't know there, that in Fort Thomas, Kentucky, there was a fort at one time. There was a fort there down to the second, end of the Second World War. That's where this young man died after an operation for appendicitis. William Nye, class, uh, would have been the class of 21, fell among the first victims of influenza. Uh, his station was stationed in Great Lakes, Chicago, which I believe would have been a naval base at the time. Okay. And there are more. The past couple of weeks brought news of the death in France of James Wallace Costigan and John King. And you can read a little bit about them and, um, and the, the fighting that they did as well. So the war certainly came home in a very real fashion uh, to the university. But the most famous of all the young men who went off to fight and who died for the cause was this young man here, George W. Buddy. And I'd like to talk a little bit about him. 
There are certain things we know and some things we do not know about him. But George Buddy, we know, was killed in France near the city of Ville-Montre. And ironically, he died on Armistice Day. He was killed on November the 11th, probably hours, maybe minutes, before the armistice went into effect. He had been a student here, graduated from the class of 1917, joined the Marines, was a sniper, and he had maintained very close ties to Xavier while he was away. He saw a great deal of action. He was wounded at the Battle of Ch Chateau Thierry. He saw action at the Battle of Soissons and the Verdun sector of the Oregon Forest. And he was much decorated. This is interesting. This is the United States Army Distinguished Service Cross Citation. And it lines up here, you probably can't read it too well. How he served his country, sacrificed his life for his country, and is signed by General Pershing at the bottom. That's high honor. He, he was the, uh, the chief um, commander in chief of the military at the time. But um, we also know that the university or the college at the time honored this man and as they should have done. And um, here is the, uh, and this still exists. This is a picture of the dedication of the memorial in his honor. This memorial exists over in the Edgecliff building. It is still there. And you really should go over some time and take a look at it. This particular monument is right there. It was a fountain at the time. It was dedicated, as you can see, I think in 1929, in honor of George Biden. He was thought at the time to be the last American casualty of the war. And I would prove just exactly which one was last and a little bit hard to do. But that's what was commonly thought. And that's why he was honored with this uh, memorial. The people there uh, would be the colonel from the Marines, and I suppose a lieutenant with him, George Buddy Sr., his father, and on the far right is Father Hubert Brockman, who was president of the college at the time, after whom Brockman Hall is named. This gives you a better picture of what that memorial looks like today. Uh, it is quite nice. It now uh, has houses the statue of Our Lady of Cincinnati. But do stop by some time, and uh, it memorializes a, a really great man, George Buddy. The plaque to the, uh, to, to the right of it, as you look, simply reads, George W. Buddy, class of 17, is traditionally regarded as the last American to die in action in World War I. A U.S. Marine who was killed by enemy machine gun fire in France on the morning of Armistice Day, November the 11th. So um, uh, he, he is so honored. But there's some good news that comes out of the First World War as well, and that's what I like to talk about uh, before we end today. It is commonly said that Xavier went co-ed in 1918, and there's some truth to that, but I'd like to clarify the record with just a few facts and we'd like to talk about it. <laughs> Women at Xavier, the first one. In the summer of 1914, Xavier introduced women to the University of the College at the time uh, for the very first time. In the summer of 1914, religious women were admitted to a newly created summer program. What had happened is this. The state of Ohio was now insisting on teacher certification. Many religious women and nuns taught in grade schools and high schools. They needed certification. They needed college courses. So Xavier, to accommodate them, opened a summer program in 1914. And about 100 nuns came. It was a very popular program right from the beginning. In 1917, they expanded that program. The Saturday morning classes for religious women were added as a continuation of the summer program. And so therefore, and I think this we should have probably noted earlier in the year, June the 21st, 1918, three women graduated from St. University for the first time, all religious women. Sister Mary Diodata of the Sisters of Charity, Sisters Columba and Sister Mary the Lords of the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth, Kentucky. So uh, they are the first women to graduate from our hallowed halls. But it is true, in the fall of 1918, we opened our doors to women, both religious and others, and they were ended, but in the evening school, the Saturday school, and the summer programs exclusively. 
And then in 1969, that was when women were admitted to all the colleges and universities. This is, uh, appears August the 30th in the uh, Cincinnati Enquirer. Uh, for the first time in 78 years of its history, St. Xavier College this fall will open its doors in the Department of Commerce and Sociology to women of Cincinnati and vicinity. Not exactly correct. There have been women here before, but this really is when we might call educational, at least in the evening. And these are advertisements for that program. There are businessmen and women. Make yourself more efficient. Come to Xavier and get business courses. One reason why Xavier opened up to the women at this point is that all the men had gone off the fire, many of them had. Jobs were available here in the city, and women were beginning to fill those positions in business. And that was really the reason for the business program and also the program in sociology as well. Here are further ads of it. It was referred to as Cincinnati's training school for greater service. And these are ads again, one from the Cincinnati Post, the evening paper, and I guess the other from the um, Catholic Telegraph there, advertising the same program. But we certainly have to comment at the very end then on this lady, this Miss Florence Albers. She's important for a number of reasons. Florence Albers came to Xavier in 1918 when we opened the evening school to women. She registered in the College of Commerce, the night school, in the fall of 1918. She received a Bachelor of Commerce degree in 1921, went on to get a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1927. But even more than that, in 1934, Florence Albers became Xavier's first dean of women. And I suspect the first woman administrator at Xavier University. We'll have to check that in to be sure, but I suspect that's the case. Just one final picture, which I thought you would find fun. One other thing that came out of the war. The boulevard is renamed. The boulevard that ran out in front of our university here was called Bloody Run Boulevard. Not too many people know that. Well, shortly after the war, that changed. Boulevard is renamed Victory Lane substituted for Bloody Run by War. Victory Lane, now Victory Parkway, was substituted for the name Bloody Run Boulevard by the Board of Park Commissioners yesterday afternoon. The change in name was made to the request of Edward Hefner, owner of the Alms Hotel, which is on Victory Parkway at William Howard Tab, who stated that the groups of name Bloody Run and proved a detriment to his business. <laughs> so Bloody Run became Victory Lane and now Victory Parkway. But you might like just to know that. But, so that concludes our remarks and hope we haven't gone too long. Thank you. Jane, uh, should we have